it's me, Kimberly, and I want to let you in on a little secret. I know deep down many of you aspire to be podcasters too. I also know exactly how frustrating it can be to figure out how to get started. Well, I'm going to tell you just how easy it is with Anchor. If you haven't heard of Anchor and how it's the easiest way to make a podcast, allow me to give you the details. Anchor is free. Yes, free. I don't pay for any subscriptions or have any wacky fees to pay. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or computer, which is everything in and of itself for podcasters on the go. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership, which is awesome sauce too. Anchor is literally everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Take the leap and download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to another episode of What Had Happened, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Kimberly, bringing you lesser known true crime stories. Due to sound issues, no intro or outro music tonight, but that's all right. I hope you're all keeping warm. It snowed yesterday here in Anywhere USA. I want to thank you all for tuning in. You could be listening to anyone else right now, and I appreciate you lending me your ears. Don't forget to join the What Had Happened, a True Crime Podcast Facebook group. This is a group where we share true crime memes, talk about the cases discussed on the show, or even the ones that are gnawing at you, or you can even make suggestions for potential episodes later on down the road. You can also follow the podcast on Instagram and Twitter, and the links are down below in the description box. Warning, this episode contains graphic material, and I might curse a little lot of it. Listener discretion is advised. Also, you should probably wear earbuds. Last episode, I told you about the Texas killing fields in South Texas and the Jefferson Davis Parish Jennings 8 in Louisiana. This week, C is for cookie and K is for killer. I've done quite a few of these uh, recordings. This is not my first take, so my voice is shredded. I will not be giving you my cookie monster impersonation today. You'll live. I hope. Today, I'll be telling you what had happened in Philadelphia at the hands of the cookie monster killer, Harrison Graham. Here are a few tidbits about Philadelphia, aka the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia is the home of the Liberty Bell and the signing of the Declaration of Independence. On 10 November 1775, the baddest, sexiest, illest, most vicious, elite military branch was conceived. It was on this day that the United States Marine Corps was established at Tun Tavern by Captain Samuel Nicholas. Simplify, brothers and sisters. Philadelphia is also the birthplace of many talented and beloved treasures, such as the incomparable Patti LaBelle, drum and hip-hop maestro Quest Love, songstress Jilly from Philly, Jill Scott, and the sultry Daryl Hall of Hall and Oates. Comedic and cinematic phenoms include Tina Fey, Kevin Bacon, and Bradley Cooper. And lastly, what's a trip to Philadelphia without a trip to either Geno's or Jim's South Street for a Philly cheesesteak? With such potent symbols of freedom, democracy, and brotherly love, what went wrong with Harrison Graham? Harrison Graham was born September 9, 1959 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Harrison was the eldest of five children. His mother, Lillian Graham Jeter, was just 16 when she gave birth to him. 
It is unverified, but Harrison's mother claimed in 1971 her son, who was 12 at the time, was diagnosed with a mental disorder and hospitalized for two years at a children's mental facility. After his treatment at the facility, he ping-ponged between foster homes and running away. His home life was chaotic, dysfunctional, and erratic to say the least. At an early age, Harrison began displaying signs of intellectual disability, which subsequently resulted in academic and disciplinary issues in school. Due to chronic absences and failing grades, Harrison was forced to drop out of school in the 10th grade. When he was a boy, Harrison would later recall being the lover and employee of a male pimp. Turning to the open arms of the seedy streets and finding love in the arms of the predatory monsters that climbed from the sewers, Harrison felt conflicted in his homosexual proclivities and drug-abusing lifestyle when his mother, after being primarily uninvolved, attempted to reform her son and rid him of his, quote, perversions. Harrison would return home with his mother, leaving the streets and his true desires behind for a while. Throughout the 70s, Harrison developed a diverse labor and construction skill set, making a good name for himself among laborers in the Philadelphia area. In 1979, 20-year-old Harrison was told to move out of his parents' home due to his drug use which was strictly forbidden and frowned upon by his mother. Harrison gathered the few possessions he owned, including his favorite possession, a plush cookie monster doll, and moved into an apartment in a crime and drug riddled neighborhood, presumably the very same neighborhood he spent his aggravated and agitated teens in. It was during this time that Harrison is said to have developed a heavier drinking and drug problem. Pimps and prostitutes alike became the company he frequently kept, reverting to the crowd he felt most comfortable with from his adolescence. While the company and activities Harrison engaged with and in were unsavory, he was still described as being an overall gentle man. Physically, Harrison was described as being tall, standing six feet, and athletic in build, his shoulders broad and apparent brawny and lumbering, his hands large and strong, medium to dark brown in complexion depending on the time of year and amount of time he spent laboring in the summer sun. Harrison was also known to alternate between different facial hairstyles and monikers. People knew Harrison as Harrison, Marty, Frank, and Junior. In personality, he was perceived and said to not be violent towards others, nor did he have a criminal record. This is going to be later on contested. Spoiler alert. In 1983, Harrison moved into a row house complex that contained many vacant units. A number of residents, including Harrison, fenced off a small section of the parking lot near the building. This crude structure consisted of small walls with two small windows through which they bought drugs. In the following four years, Harrison turned his apartment into a drug den where friends and acquaintances would often visit to buy and use drugs, consisting mainly of Ritalin and similar substances. Despite all of these darker habits, Harrison never engaged in violent acts, regularly paid his rent, and played basketball with the local youth living off of his meager disability pension. 
As a way to support his $300 monthly disability check, Harrison dealt all of the popular drugs of the time. These decrepit, dilapidated, ghost town neighborhoods, a haven for drugs and prostitution. The nearly abandoned hovels of buildings providing hiding places, shooting galleries, disintegrating heaps for Johns and pros alike, and concealment for other nefarious acts. From the exterior, 1631 North 19th Street appeared to be yet another abandoned and long forgotten residence, abandoned by the World War II GIs and their families who escaped for Levittown during the White Flight. While the windows were broken and the front door was missing, there were in fact several residents. Over the years, a putrid odor began to slowly seep from beneath the door, windows, and walls of one unit in particular. It wasn't the usual smell of garbage and bodily fluids that perfumed the thresholds and halls of these unkempt slums and crumbling tenements. Tenants complained numerous times to their landlord, slumlord. Nathaniel Choice to no avail about the offensively odoriferous stench. As Harrison gaffed off the threats of Mr. Choice, his landlord, the smell became stronger and more potent, invading and permeating the insides of the surrounding units. This was a smell the residents simply couldn't shake any longer when they retreated into their homes. Finally, after complaints mounted, the landlord finally took action. August 9, 1987 was hot, humid, and uncomfortable. It was the kind of heat that gripped you and clung. On that Sunday at noon, the landlord and his nephew, as well as his son, had no idea what they were about to discover. Mr. Choice was said to have told Harrison he needed to vacate the premises immediately due to his failure to rectify and comply with basic hygiene and sanitation within his home. Harrison refused to allow him into his home, barricading himself inside. Mr. Choice could hear shuffling and hammering for a few minutes before Harrison fled through the bedroom fire escape with a few belongings. Unable to enter the apartment, the police were called. Responding officer Pete Scalantino immediately identified the smell of death upon entering the building, following the scent three floors up to Harrison's front door. Once inside the unit, Mr. Choice and company probably wished they had stayed on the outside of the dwelling. The apartment was small, each room approximately 10 by 12 feet. In the living area of the two-room apartment, Officer Scalantino and Mr. Choice trudged through knee-high piles of trash. There were said to be piles of filthy soiled clothing and blankets, moldy newspapers and magazines, and empty containers of food intermingled with rotting food being devoured by maggots. There were piles of petrified fecal matter and bottles containing what one can only assume to be urine. The wallpaper peeled, Floors sagged, and the ceilings were warped. Flies, roaches, fleas, and maggots thriving in this endless cycle of life of rot. On the walls, crude drawings of nude women were scrawled like primitive cave drawings, derogatory words written in bodily fluids. The bloody tableau, a morbid glimpse into the darkest sense of hatred its artist possessed for the female form. 
There were empty alcohol containers and the floor was littered with hypodermic needles and other drug paraphernalia. Blue and red caps of Ritalin, a stimulant, and Toluene, a downer, blanketed sections of the floor. A wall, it appeared, taking up about six feet of the tiny room was under construction. Officer Scalantino then attempted to gain access into the second room, which seemed to be the source of the intense stench. The name Marty was etched on the door. Unable to gain entry into the room, he peeked through the peephole. That's where he saw what appeared to be a body on the floor. At this point, Officer Scalantino then gave the commander the command for whomever was in the room to come out, but the person remained motionless. This was when the responding officer called for backup from esteemed homicide detective James Hansen, who had just worked the Heidnik case. Officer Scalatino, with the help of investigator Charles Johnson and detective James Hansen, worked effortlessly or worked tirelessly in the heat, claustrophobic clutter, and funk to try to pry the door open. When they entered the room, the body of a nude deceased African American woman was lying on a mattress. Her bloated, decomposing body in full view, a sweater pulled over her head. Next to the body on the mattress lay the body of a second woman sprawling on the floor. She too was badly bloated and decomposing, her limbs swollen. She wore a denim miniskirt and a light colored shirt that said Portois with a rose. Due to the deplorable conditions of the apartment, as well as the conditions of the two bodies, it was impossible to determine immediately if the deaths were drug-related, homicide, or worse. You see, five months prior, on March 24, 1987, serial killer Gary Heidnick had been apprehended in his house of horrors just three miles away from Harrison's home. As detectives ascended on Harrison's apartment, the crowd began to develop as well. Between the biohazard dump site crime scene and the curious masses, the police were forced to tape off the building. Hazmat suit-clad officers and masked detectives sifted through the mountains of garbage when the skeletal remains of victim number three were discovered beneath a pile of debris and rags beneath the second victim, which indicated to investigators women had been dying in this apartment for longer than a few days. As hours of sifting carefully through syringes, feces, both dog and human, Broken glass and other trash ticked by the, ske the skeletal and mummified remains of victim number four were found, wrapped in a sheet and concealed under another pile of trash. By 5.30, the remains of victim number five were found sandwiched between two mattresses. The body encapsulated and mummified in a manner that would appear that Harrison slept on top of this very bed, his weight compressing the remains constantly for an undetermined amount of time. This body had not been wrapped in sheets and the level of decomposition was, fa was far advanced, was so far advanced that the gender was unidentifiable. Not too long after, the after that gruesome discovery, an officer alerted investigators to the sixth body, which was inside of the closet of the in the back of the room. This body was covered in trash and her clothes were tattered. By now, the hot day was muggy and sticky as a light rain blanketed the area. The smell of decomposing bodies now mingling with wet trash. It appeared to detectives and officers that Harrison had been living in one room and using the other to store bodies. 
High power searchlights were brought in to search the rest of the creepy building for remaining bodies. As it grew darker, it became increasingly more difficult for investigators to work. With six bodies to process and nothing else they could do for the day, the search was called off for the night. By the 10 p.m. local nightly news, they were reporting the nightmare on North 19th Street. Quote, people came out of their houses despite the light rain to watch as more official vehicles pulled up. Empty body bags were in and full ones were carried out by men in masks. Quote, the curious crowd crowded into the narrow block of North 19th Street in the steaming August heat to watch the grim parade of body bags, wrote Joseph Grace and John Morrison of the Philadelphia Daily News. Quote, one after another, less than an hour apart, Six bodies were removed from the debris-strewn apartment. The following morning, newspapers featured a relatively handsome photo of an unassumingly good-looking Harrison, and local police and sheriffs placed an APB out for him. While the media featured nonstop coverage of the carnage discovered in Harrison's apartment the night before and the manhunt for the man believed to be responsible, investigators resumed their search, widening it to the outside grounds of the apartment building. With six bodies already having been discovered in the cramped 20 by 24 space, the day before, they had to assume there were other potential victims. The inside, outside, and surrounding area rooftops to ground considered an active crime scene that needed to be combed through thoroughly. Officers and crews were brought in to dig as Harrison had been reported as digging in the property's backyard and the vacant lot across the street from time to time. While searching the rooftop of the building, officers found a dismembered leg and foot, the first pieces of victim number seven in a moldy canvas bag hidden under a discarded mattress. While bones were found while digging, while in the, in the digging process, they were found to be the remains of the three dogs Harrison owned that died over the years. Upon canvassing and questioning the building and neighborhood, officers found that Marty, as Harrison was known by them, was a gentle and relatively quiet man. When Harrison had too much to drink, they said he would dance in the street. None of the female tenants in his building said there, were an, there was anything to give them reason to pause or feel like they were in the presence of danger. For some of the neighbors, Marty even provided handyman services. When around the children, a shy, childlike junior would talk to them in a cookie monster voice. Background checks would prove fruitless as Harrison had no history or record of domestic violence, nor had he a history of committing any acts of violence against women. In fact, there wasn't any criminal background that could be found. One neighbor would paint a drastically different picture of Harrison, though. The neighbor stated that while in Harrison's apartment, they had seen a collection of disturbing composition notebooks filled with crude sketches of naked, mutilated women. Some were missing breasts, limbs, and their heads. The neighbor also recalled seeing Harrison dangle a woman named Renee from his third floor window. As she screamed and pleaded with him, Harrison pulled her back inside. Eventually, several other women came forward with claims that Harrison tried to rape them 
or hit them on the head. An anonymous drug user told reporters that a person could get any kind of drugs in Marty's apartment. She had assumed that the foul odor, odor in there was due to toilets not working and mounds of trash laying around. An initial warrant for Harrison's arrest was issued for the several counts of abuse of a corpse until detectives could untangle the particulars of this most peculiar case. As word began to spread, as in most cases, the initial reaction to Harrison potentially being a serial killer was shock and disbelief. Neighbors and family alike found it hard to believe this easygoing, mild-mannered man was capable of committing these most atrocious acts that were being reported. One younger brother told reporters, quote, Marty was afraid to go to our grandmother's funeral. He stayed outside. He was certain his brother could not have been sleeping in the same room with corpses, as reported. During this time, Philadelphia coroner's office were left to perform the autopsies of the bodies that had been brought in the day before. Victims one and two were identified as women and there initially didn't appear to be any signs of physical trauma or violence, but due to their stages of decomposition, it was difficult to ascertain. The coroner was able to determine that the first two victims were only dead for a matter of a few days. Forensic anthropologists were brought in to assist in the dissection and autopsy of the other victims. They were also trying to help determine the sex, race, and other physical markers to help give any way to identify these remains because they were so badly decomposed and they'd been mummified in some instances. Pardon me, that was a slight digression. While detectives worked to find Harrison and piece together their case, the media aided in helping to identify the victims and track down Harrison. Pardon me. Local newspapers and news plastered Harrison's face everywhere and tips began to flood in. Family members and friends from all over the city began to call to report their missing loved ones. One husband contacting authorities because he hadn't seen his wife, 36-year-old Mary Cookie Jeter Mathis, in two years but knew she was a victim of Harrison's based off of the description of the shirt found on her remains. The shirt stood out to him, he said, because he bought it for his wife. Another witness told authorities she feared her 33-year-old roommate, Sandra Garvin, was one of the six bodies found as she had gone to buy drugs from Harrison and never returned. Other key pieces of evidence that helped identify the victims of Harrison found among the trash were articles of jewelry, three distinctive earrings, and a heart-shaped necklace. While all of the evidence of what investigators believed happened in the tiny hovel of horrors, their suspect Harrison Graham was still in the wind. He was Osama bin Laden in the mountains of Pakistan, you guys. A specter that remained steps ahead of the police. For sure. For a few days to you guys. Spoiler alert. While his mother and four other siblings all still resided in Philadelphia, he had yet to make contact with them. When detectives were able to contact Harrison's mother, Lillian, she was able to provide them with a few pieces of information they didn't already know about her son. Several months before, Harrison told his mother his girlfriend, Mary, was pregnant. 
when she asked her soon to be when she asked about her soon to be grandchild on the 4th of July, Harrison told her the baby died. Lillian also told detectives about Robin DeShazer, a past girlfriend who lived with Harrison a few years prior. Robin was also a drug addict and had moved into Harrison's apartment with him in 1983. Lastly, Lillian explained Harrison's mental disabilities with detectives. There had been sightings of Harrison at soup kitchens, churches, buses, and shelters throughout the city, but he still remained elusive. While the manhunt for Harrison was still underway, so was the complete search of the building he lived in and all of the adjacent properties. It was on August 15th, during this continued search, that the remains of victim number seven were discovered in the basement of a building three doors down from Harrison's apartment. The seventh victim had been wrapped in a blanket and secured with electrical cord. These remains, a head and torso, were discovered under what was described as a burn pile. There is virtually no information on the victims, but they were later identified as being 27-year-old Cynthia Brooks, 25-year-old Valerie Jameson, 36-year-old Mary Cookie Jeter Mathis, 22-year-old Barbara Mahoney, 29-year-old Robin DeShazer, 33-year-old Sandra Garvin, and 24-year-old Patricia Franklin. A forensic exam concluded that the two recent victims had been strangled 10 days prior to discovery, while the other five had been dead from between 6 to 12 months prior. The building was ordered condemned for several code violations, and its tenants forced to relocate. The Department of Health and Human Services providing temporary shelter for the newly displaced neighbors of Harrison Graham. While police searched for Harrison, family members of those who believed their loved ones had been recovered from Harrison's apartment were urged to provide the coroner's office with dental records to help identify the victims. Two days later, on August 17th, Lillian Jeter received a call from her son Harrison. He said he was tired and hungry. He asked his mother if she would be willing to meet him somewhere and give him something to eat. His mother told him he needed to turn himself in. Lillian told her son, quote, stop running, son. Whatever happened, we can work this out. Just come on home. We love you. Your family loves you. Harrison waited at a street corner for the police to pick him up. He was apprehended roughly 10 blocks away from his apartment. For hours, investigators chipped and whittled away at Harrison, initially claiming that the seven bodies police discovered were in the apartment when he moved in. Harrison finally began to explain what happened. Murders committed by his hands, but not his mind. It was Marty, Harrison began. Harrison indicated that all of the women had been killed that year in the beginning of January, although there was speculation about this. Quote, it was just something that started to happen, he commented. And once he started, he couldn't stop. As it's been noted, Harrison's upbringing was tragic from the beginning, not only suffering from his mental issues, he was preyed upon by a male pimp 
who abused him and employed him to most likely recruit as well as trick. Amidst all of that dysfunction, Harrison had to wrangle with his sexual identity and confusion. His mother, by my calculation again, was approximately 16 years old when she began having her children. At some point in her 30s, she became heavily involved in the church and condemned homosexuality. Lillian became interested in her son after the worst had already been done and he was already far beyond intervention or repair. Sidebar, you guys, Lillian Smoon furled up on him like Tara's mom in True Blood. You guys remember that? Fuck that bitch. Wanting to please his mother and conceal his innermost, darkest desires, Harrison's personality split. It isn't clear, but these altars, as I'm going to refer to them, these altars Harrison's mind created could have been present since he was a child. Each altar representing either the strength Harrison lacked, the person Lillian wanted Harrison to be, and the little boy lost in all of this despair. Marty, Frank, and Junior were the altars created by Harrison. Marty was said to be the God-fearing homosexual disavowing man that Lillian wanted Harrison to be. We'll first get into a little bit about Marty. It might seem a little disconjointed, but let's roll with it. Among his victims was his former girlfriend, Robin DeShazer. Graham stated in an interview, I wanted so badly to love her, but I could not stop my need to do the other things. I never liked the sex, and it got to be much easier when I didn't have to see her. To explain, Harrison somehow felt more at ease having sex with his girlfriend once he had strangled her. In a sense, he said his secrets were safer with her dead. Quote, she knew about Marty and his desires. I didn't want her looking at me the way that I seen God being angry through her eyes. Harrison lured and entrapped all of his victims with drugs. Harrison targeted both strangers and acquaintances. Consensual, consensual sex led to strangulation, which, as Harrison explained, always shocked him in the morning when he'd awake to find a woman lying next to him in bed dead. Harrison confessed to being so shaken and afraid by what Marty did to his first victim, girlfriend Robin DeShazer, and what to do with her simply, he simply left her body in his apartment. It was not until he brought a different woman to his apartment that he attempted to conceal Robin by hoisting her corpse into his, onto his roof through a bedroom window. I said Marty, I should have said Harrison. I did correct myself in action. During breaks, Harrison would sketch the faces of women. The detectives were surprised to find that Harrison was an articulate, talented artist and was not, as they assumed, illiterate. He apparently read the Bible avidly. Whilst being interrogated, Harrison wrote and signed a 10-page confession but during arraignment, his mental capacity was brought to task. Harrison's public defender, Joel Moldovsky, would argue that his client wasn't given due process as he wasn't told, nor did he understand his right to have counsel present during his interview, despite his mother being present. On August 25th, the Daily News published an anonymous account by a former lover of Harrison Graham who said that in August, in January of 1986, Graham had told her that he, quote, offed another girlfriend and tossed her out of the window. 
She waited one day until he'd gone out and then went to the back window. On the roof below was an old weathered mattress. She went out, lifted it, and found a skeleton. She hadn't believed his story about murder before, but now she did. Even with the discovery, she stayed with him. Eventually, she informed the police and then moved in with her mother, but the police never located the body. When she learned about the bodies found in the apartment, she had counted herself lucky. Quote, I get nightmares and I can't sleep, she told reporters. Quote, it's like his hands are around my throat and the life's going out of me. Eventually, she would lose her anonymity presenting her story in court. Now, in reference to the unidentified skull. Oh, big breath. The single unidentified victim with the morgue tagged 3760 was placed into the hands of forensic sculptor Frank Bender, whose studio was on Philadelphia South Street. Since 1976, he'd worked with law enforcement to help with victim identification and the age progression of fugitives. He'd gotten his start in this field after he was invited to tour the morgue to better learn about human anatomy. While there, he saw a decomposing corpse that had not yet been identified. She only had a number, 5233. The woman had been shot three times in the head and dumped near the airport. The possibility of identifying her seemed hopeless, but Bender said he believed that he knew what she looked like. He made a sculpture from her skull and got such a good likeness that 5233 eventually got a name, which led to her killer, who was convicted. It wasn't long before he was invited into more forensic cases by the local and state police and even the U.S. Marshals, so it was no surprise that he'd be asked to assist with the identification of the victim of Harrison, the third one found. She had been a tall, thin, black woman, said the anthropologist, about five foot nine, between 20 and 30, with a narrow skull. She was found nearly skeletal, skeletonized beneath the decom, decom, decomposing, oh my goodness, I can speak tonight, decomposing corpse of another woman. At the time of her demise, she'd been wearing khaki slacks and two long sleeve shirts and the two earrings found next to her were presumed to be hers. Bender completely deflushed the skull and placed tiny rubber posts on it to guide him in adding about five pounds of brown clay for the right tissue depth. He then put fake eyeballs into the sockets. The elongated face made this victim more of an individual with a unique appearance, a pointed chin and an asymmetrical nose aperture. Adding a hairstyle that he believed was right for her, Bender had photos taken of for the newspapers. Then authorities waited and hoped that someone would recognize her and come forward. An older couple reported that their daughter had been missing for six months. They knew that she'd been an acquaintance of Harrison's, and the description they gave was a match. The ME's investigator got the young woman's medical records to compare against the remains. He also showed the family photographs of the completed bust, but they weren't sure. Yet others who had known the missing woman believed that the sculpture resembled her, and they recalled the earrings that she'd worn that were just like those found next to the corpse. A past chest x-ray that showed an odd characteristic of one rib finally clinched it on January 26th, 1988. She was Valerie Jameson, 25, the mother of two sons, and she had disappeared in April the year before. Now back in the past. On August 27th, 1987, a detective read aloud the gruesome account of findings during a six-hour hearing. Harrison was reportedly agitated, rocking back and forth as the detective read that the defendant had described maggots in his apartment as furball bugs to a visitor. He, quote, had to stay high all of the time to ignore the birds eating a body outside his window. 
drugged and in a paranoid state to begin with, Harrison was panicked when the police arrived, literally throwing bodies into the back bedroom. Until this point, he had staged the corpses of his most recent murders in the front room. In a chaotic flurry, he hurried and boarded up the, room, the door and ran. This, according to Joel Moldovsky, among other characteristically bizarre behaviors, were paramount in determining his client's competency, or lack thereof. Dr. Robert Stanton, a psychiatrist who evaluated Harrison, cited him of, as having an IQ of 63, which is considered to be less than mentally competent. This, in addition to his substance abuse and addictions, resulted in a man, according to the laws of the state of Pennsylvania, who was incapable to stand trial. Harrison was suffering from chemically induced auditory hallucinations, psychosis, blackouts, and chronic paranoia. Moreover, psychologist Albert Levitt testified that aside from the defendant's chemical and physiological issues, Harrison was incompetent in fundamental academic skills, reading, writing, math, and telling time. Contrary to the prosecution's stance, Moldovsky was arguing insanity, specifically a multiple personality disorder. During an interview with Philadelphia's Daily News, the attorney commented that Harrison Graham often spoke in a second and third personality. Marty was an easygoing handyman. He liked his mother, he was a heterosexual, and a religious zealot. At times, Junior would show himself. This personality was most familiar as the childlike male whose neighbors purportedly remembered hanging on to his cookie monster stuffed animal. It was Frank who was responsible for the heinous crimes of both murder and necrophilia. It was Frank who could not stand to be with women in brutal contrast with Marty who hated the sinful nature of homosexuality and perversion. Marty viewed homosexuality and perversion as a condemnation to eternal death. Frank, however, was streetwise and, streetwise and street smart, with an insatiable appetite for drugs and an even more insatiable appetite for harder core drugs sex and homosexual relations, including his own prostitution. Again, proclivities he had been introduced to in his own adolescence. Despite all of this, Judge Edward Meckel still declared Harrison was competent for trial. He based his opinion in part on the DA's counselor, Robert Sardiff, who had told reporters that he felt Harrison had been utterly able during his initial confession. Pre-trial Harrison was involved also in a fight in prison and blamed his part on Frank, which the prosecution summarily dismissed as Harrison being able to fake it. Psychologist Dr. Gerald Cook offered a statement that Harrison had an organic brain damage or had organic brain damage, although he wasn't able to be an expert on the subject and the issue had already been dismissed by a neurologist. He would also go on to say that Harrison suffered from sexual sadism, which is not a mental illness that makes a person insane or absolve him of guilt, so he seemed to be an ineffective witness on key issues for both the prosecution and the defense. Thumbs down, you guys. One star. Harrison Graham's trial began on March 7, 1988. 
Early on, he refused a jury trial during the preliminary court hearings because he fully admitted his guilt on all counts. The prosecutor's office demanded the death penalty, while his lawyer, Joel Modowski, demanded that his client be given a lenient sentence. According to Moldowski, due to his intellectual disability and psychophysical development, Graham was incapable of distinguishing right from wrong, and this, coupled with heavy drug abuse, made him act on impulse and without any self-control. Wowzers. Holy shit, Snacks Batman, that's scary. While the proceedings were going on, Harrison appeared to be completely calm, friendly, and alert. While his alters did appear throughout court, prosecution would argue Harrison understood the proceedings well enough to participate accordingly. Two of the prosecution's experts would testify that Harrison was faking his disorganized state during his earlier hearing. In his present state, it was noted that Harrison was lucid and clear-minded with the aid of antipsychotic meds. During all of this, Lillian remained in her son's corner, defending him, saying repeatedly that her son was innocent and incapable of committing the murders because he was, quote, simple. His one of his foster mothers, as well as psychologists, would also be brought in as witnesses for the defense. The step the foster mother would go on to say that although he was a troubled youth, he was essentially a good boy, um, just mentally disturbed and disabled, but overall just a good kid. As the judge was about to deliberate, the prosecution introduced a star witness, a woman named Paula who claimed to have lived with Harrison for years. Paula asserted that Harrison was violent and on several, several occasions beat upon her as well as attempted to strangle her. Paula claimed that Harrison bragged about murdering his ex-girlfriend, Robin, and then committing acts of necrophilia with her body. Upon this omission, Paula said she decided to break things off with Harrison, even though he said that was the reason for killing Robin, was she had attempted to leave him. Paula claimed to have been tortured and terrorized at Harrison's hands. What was supposed to lock in the case for the prosecution turned into a point for the defense. Holes were poked in Paula's confession left and right. First, Robin had been beaten, not strangled, leading to the conclusion that the witness had lied about her former boyfriend's testimony. Further, Harrison had no history of long-term relationships. In fact, he had killed his only so-called girlfriend. It did not fit the pattern of Graham's murders or personality to have maintained a three-year relationship with any woman, much less one that he would allow to live. If anything, Paula's statements that Harrison kept her in a drug in drug induced stupors and was often using himself only added to the stability of the defense's claims that the that the defendant was not in control of his faculties. When Officer Flynn brought Harrison's Cookie Monster toy in as evidence, Harrison asked, Can I have that back? I sleep with that. Further assisting the prosecution's case, Mary Hogan was called to testify. Mary Hogan also testified to having lived with him and survived. She said they'd have sex four or five times a day. He tried to strangle her as well, and she saw the body of Robin on the roof. That meant the corpse had been there since before October 1986. In order to get out with her belongings, she had to seek assistance from the police. Because Graham, had, because Harrison 
had threatened to kill her with a machete and had shut her inside the apartment. She did tell an officer about the corpse on the roof, but he didn't believe her. The prosecutor seemed to want to force her to see the error of her ways by subjecting her to one graphic slide after another of what had been found in the apartment. Even worse, Moldovsky requested that she pull the cookie monster puppet out of a bag of items that Graham had taken with him from the apartment. She did not want to touch it, although she said that he chatted with it every day. There was drama in the humid courtroom when Hogan said she'd never loved Graham and had not been pregnant as he thought she was. At this testimony, he grabbed the witness table, jumped up, and shoved aside two deputies. He wanted them to leave him alone. Apparently, he disliked the idea that, he, that he'd been duped, or so his attorney said to reporters. On March 8th, Harrison Graham told the judge that he was not responsible for the murders and that, quote, someone else had done it. Harrison put his fate in Judge Latrone's hands, waiving his right to a jury. April 28, 1988, Harrison was found guilty of first-degree murder and abuse of a corpse on all counts. His attorney told reporters that he doubted Harrison knew that he'd been found guilty or what the ramifications of that would mean. He then directed his own attention towards keeping his client from execution. The large black man listened to his conviction, barely wincing. Afterwards, he told reporters that, quote, everything would work out just fine. He then requested his cookie monster be given back to him now that it was no longer needed as evidence. Judge Latrone ruled that while he would sentence the defendant, Harrison Graham, to six death sentences, he would first be remanded to prison to serve out a life term. The single life sentence was for Robin's murder. She was the first, so there were no other murders to add aggravating factors. Harrison was additionally sentenced by Latrone to serve six consecutive sentences of 7 to 14 years each. Harrison's mother was not able to make herself present for that ruling. However, his attorney was greatly relieved. By allowing Harrison to serve his convictions of death prior to his life sentencing, he had achieved a life sentence without a possibility of parole. Latrone had taken into account the mitigating factors of Harrison's abusive, neglectful childhood. While some scoffed at his compassion, it was nevertheless true that Harrison had learned to adapt to unthinkable circumstances as a boy and that in part to survive, it was acceptable to believe that he had developed altered personalities, a not uncommon characteristic of broken adults which stems from tragic early childhood conditions. The prosecution also felt that the conviction was in, quote, all interests and protected everyone involved, the victims, the victims' families, and Harrison Graham from Harrison Graham himself. Until 1994, Harrison Graham was a prisoner at Harrisburg Penitentiary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But then the Supreme Court, after a routine review deemed his sentence unethical and illegal. The court had ruled earlier on that Graham's life sentence be overturned and that the death sentence be implemented. He was scheduled to die on December 7, 1988. Judge Latrone was again in the position of making a decision to let Graham live or die. He stayed the execution. The murderer's case seemed to spend much of its time in appeals and in and out of higher courts until in 2002, the U.S. Supreme Court banned the executions of all mentally retarded criminals. 
Arison did not meet the initial requirements of the ban. As stated by a psychiatrist involved in his case, quote, he tested lower than he functioned. So even if his IQ was below 70, he was not mentally retarded. But because according to the criteria established by the American Psychiatric Association that an onset of mental illness occurring before the age of 18 years mandated the same relief from execution, Harrison Graham was permanently off of death row. Today, Harrison resides in a medium security facility in Pennsylvania. His case manager described him as mild and nonviolent. He has received a minister a minister's certificate and continues to practice his faith. It is often said of substance abusers that once the drug is removed, sanity returns. This may be the case of Harrison Graham. And faced with the haunting of childhood demons and his ability to deal with them alone, perhaps the security of his routine and his cell walls provi provides the, the structure and predictability he never knew. And yet, when the interviewer who I just quoted called to interview Mark to interview Harrison, he still told the interviewer. He could only do the interview if he promised to call him Marty. Wowzers, guys. So, what had happened is a lot of deep-seated childhood trauma caused an adult man to commit unspeakable acts as well as his mental capacity, which was already low bar, to fracture and split. He had to assume personalities to cope with the different things coming at him in life. His mother was a homophobic religious zealot. Harrison wanted to please his mother. Marty was the altar that pleased Lillian. Frank was a sick, depraved fuck who was street savvy and loved all of the dark, dink, underbelly type things that you can only imagine. And in order for Harrison to get that release, he needed to create Frank. Frank was possibly also a strong figure, like an alpha, where in all honesty, although he was large in stature, Harrison was absolutely a beta. And then there was Junior. Junior represents the broken child within. I can visualize this man laying on these mattresses, sucking his thumb, clutching his cookie monster plushie. I can visualize him sitting there in the corners of this disgusting fucking room, having full out conversations in the mindset and voice of a child. So in the first episode, I, whilst talking about culpability, said that it is difficult for me to find adults uh, not culpable of their actions. But I did say that there are exceptions to the rule, Harrison Graham being one of them. This is an altogether tragic situation. And I find that He was a victim who turned into, I don't even know that he even really recalls anything that he did because he wasn't in control. We don't know that. I mean, some say he faked it. That's likely, you know, that's a possibility. But if 
his mother was saying that he was seeking treatment in a mental facility for two years as an adolescent he either picked up that hack there or it was something he went in there with i am not going to dispel his demons i'm not going to play devil's advocate on whether or not he had multiple personalities I honestly believe that he most likely did. Well, whew, that was a doozy. We talked for quite a while, and I hope you guys liked the episode. I'll be back at it in a few more days with another lesser-known true crime story. Thank you again for listening to What Had Happened, a true crime podcast. Again, I'm your host, Kimberly. Talk to you soon. Have a great night.